أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إن الحمد لله <تصفيق> نحمد تعالى ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو محتد ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا واتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثير ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا واتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن الأسلك الحديث كتاب الله وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم والشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدع وكل بدع ضلالة وكل ضلالة وأهلها في النار ثم أما بعد أي المسلمون أوسيكم ونفسي بتق الله عز وجل I advise you and myself or first and foremost myself, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In all of our daily actions, to have taqwa, and to make our intention purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to gain benefit, to practice in our lives for all of our shortcomings, 
as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned, "Kullu ibn Adam khata, wa khairan khata'in tuwabun." The Prophet sallallahu rabbi wasallamuhu alayhi said, "All the children of Adam makes mistakes, and the best of those that are sinners or that make those mistakes are those who make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa taala." And I ask that Allah the Almighty blesses us to be of those, be of the Tawabin. To be of those who have tawfiq, min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to come back to Him. To have the rujur il al haq To return to the truth. And in this regard, to return to the haq, that means returning to the religion of Islam. For all of our shortcomings, we have to go back to the asl of the deen. The usul al-deen, meaning the foundation of the religion. Because this is what, when the times of trials and tribulations of the people before us, this is how they rectify themselves. They rectify themselves by going back to the basics of the religion. And they rectify themselves by returning to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so that brings the subject of my, had, uh, of my talk today, which is one simple hadith, but a hadith azim. It's a very, very great hadith. وَمَشْهُورُ بِحَدِيثِ Jibril عَلَيْهِ salatu wasalam, And it is known as the hadith of Jibreel, alayhi salatu wasalam. That was re- narrated by Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. قال, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ إِذْ طَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجْلٌ شَدِيدُ بِيَادِ الثِّيَابِ شَدِيدُ سِوَادِ الشَّعْرِ لَا يُرَى عَلَيْهِ أَثْرَ السَّفْرِ وَلَا يَعْرَفَ مِنَّا أَحَدٍ حَتَّى جَلَسَ إِلَى نَبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَأَسْنَذَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ لِرُكْبَتَيْهِ وَوَضْعَ كَافَيْهِ عَلَى فَاخِذَيْهِ وَقَالْ يَا مُحَمِّدْ أَخْبِرْنِي عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ So in this hadith, in the beginning of the hadith, that was narrated by Umar bin al-Khattab رضي الله عنه, he said, we were sitting one day with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and then a man came upon us, with an excessively white thobe or garment. And he had excessively black hair. And none of us could tell that he was a traveler. He had no signs of traveling upon him. And then he sat in front of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he put his knees to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's knees. You know, he put his knees against the Prophet Wasallam's knees. And he put his palms of his hands upon his own knees. And then he said, O oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. The Prophet Wasallam responded by saying, قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الإسلام أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة وتتيه الزكاة وتصوم رمضان وتحج البيت إن استطاعت إليه سبيل قال صدقت فأجبنا له يسأله يصدقه The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم responded by saying Islam is to bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. And that Muhammad is his last prophet and messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. And to establish the five times daily prayer, and to pay the zakat, the alms tax, and to fast the month of Ramadan, and to make the pilgrimage 
if one is able to do so. And then Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, you've spoken rightly. So the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, they responded by saying, so they, they were shocked. They said, and how could he have questioned and known the answer? And said, you've spoken, li- spoken rightly. You know, what's, what's going on with this? Then Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he, re- he said, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنَ iman." He said, tell me about iman. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam responded by saying, al, uh, said, أَن تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُوبِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنُوا بِقَدْرِ وَتُؤْمِنُوا بِخَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِ the Prophet ﷺ in responding about the question about what is Iman? What is faith? He said, It is to believe in Allah and tu'minu billahi wa malaika and the angels and his books and his... Uh, to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, to believe in the messengers and to believe in the day of judgment, yawm al-akhirah. And to believe in the divine destiny, the good of it and the bad of it. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for us to come back to this? To come back to these simple usul? It means, as was mentioned in the first part of the hadith, the arkan al-Islam, it means for us to make sure that we're establishing the salat. No matter who we are, we have to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is your wasila. This is your means to coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is your communication with your Lord, Rabbi subhanahu. This is your communication. It's not the communication that we have with the other people, but this is a direct tie with your Lord. And establishing the prayer and paying the zakat, if you have the ability, or if it becomes an obligation upon you to pay zakat, then pay it. Quickly, get rid of that. So that way it's not around your neck in case you die. And to fast, fast the month of Ramadan. All of us know this. And not all of us do this, will Allah understand. So just practicing those simple usul. If you want to see the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam come back to its place of izza, its place of honor. Its place of honor. Its place of honor comes through just practicing the religion. Practicing the basics of the religion. And making the hajj if you're able to do so. And in the second part of the hadith, we mentioned the arkan al-iman. The pillars of iman. And we said, in tu'mina billahi. Meaning to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means believing in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, it believe, and to believe in directing all your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to believe in His divine names and attributes. That's what it means to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to say, yes, amin tu billahi. You know, I believe in Allah. If if you say that, you must haqqaq a ma'na. You must have that meaning in reality. You must practice that by worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Because there's many even in the ummah. If you look at the fitna that we're dealing with right now, these trials and tribulations, I know every one of you is aware because it's all over the internet, it's all in the media. Everyone is rejoicing, everybody's excited, everybody's involved in what's going on in Egypt, what went on in Tunis, what's going on in Libya, what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in Jazair, what's going on here and there. Everyone knows about this, these trials and tribulations. You can't find a place on the earth where the Muslims are having struggles and difficulties. And why is that? Is it because we don't have enough democracy? Is it because we don't have enough freedom of speech? Is that really our our, our difficulty? I'll say no. I'd say it's because we have gotten far from the religion. If you look in every one of those places, there are Muslim countries, but you'll find many people there who don't know the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Well, alhamdulillah, many of us, we come to Islam here, and we at least know that. We know the meaning of la ilaha illallah if we've studied and we've read some books or we've looked on the internet or something. 
But in many of the places, the people take it for granted. They just say, La ilaha illallah. And then they worship whoever they want. Meaning they make supplication to the graves. You'll find this in Kethra in, in Egypt. And I'm sure you'll find it in Libya. And I know you'll find it in, in Yemen. I've seen it. And I know you'll find it in many places. In the Muslim lands. And the Muslims even here. So that's why it's important to come back to the reality of that meaning. If you really want success in this life as well as the hereafter. And the second pillar of Iman that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in that hadith is to believe in the angels. So we need to believe in the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are obedient creatures to Allah. That they never disobey Allah. And that they serve a function, each one of them. And Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he was responsible for bringing the revelation. So we have to have some knowledge of this in order to believe in it. And then to believe in the books, even though we don't see the books today. We only see the Qur'an, we only have the Qur'an. And this is what we're ordered to follow. We're ordered to follow the Qur'an, Kitab Allah. However, we have to, as a part of our creed, we have to believe in the other books. The Zabur that was given to David. The Injil that was given to uh, Jesus alayhi salatu wasalam. Wa alayhim afdal salatu wasalam upon all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the book, the, the book of Ibrahim and Musa. We have to believe in all of that even if we've never seen it. By just having at least limited knowledge of it from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And from the Qur'an. And we have to believe in the day of judgment. That yes, all of us will be responsible for our deeds. We'll be held, of account, we'll be held accountable for what we did in this life. And, what, and, and how we behaved with one another. Did we treat another, one another with kindness? Did we show brotherhood and sisterhood to one another? Did we try to learn the religion and better ourselves? All of this will be asked and held accountable for. If you have some knowledge, did you share it? If you memorize the Qur'an, did you teach someone else and did you practice it? All of that will be held accountable for. And the final pillar of Iman that was mentioned is that we have to believe in the Qadr. We have to believe in the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything that happens is by is according to divine destiny. Is according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. All of the, the fact that you were guided to Islam and your brother was not guided, your blood brother, that's part of the Qadr. The fact that so-and-so died as a Muslim and so-and-so died as a non-Muslim, that's part of the Qadr. The fact that you had sickness and so-and-so has good health, that's a part of the Qadr. Your rizq is big, his rizq is not, that's part of the Qadr. All of that is a part of the divine destiny. And we believe in it. Khayrihi wa sharrihi. The good of it and the evil of it. Meaning the evil that we don't understand. We don't understand. We may see it as sharr. We may look at something. Man, I lost my child. billah, And I pray that Allah protects all of our children. And protects us all from having these kind of difficulties and trials. But the person who lo- loses their child. They may see that as only evil. They can't see any good in that. But they don't know the divine wisdom from that. They don't know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe took that child as a child because when they would have gotten older, they were going to be in a lot of evil. And they would have died as a disbeliever. We don't know this. But we believe in the qadr. And we accept the qadr. Taslim and nafs. We have to have salama in our hearts for the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with salama to nafs. Aqulu kuli hadha wa astaghfirullah azza wa jal. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam ima ba'd. Going on to the next part of the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam. Jibreel said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa salam. He said, akhbirni an al-ihsan. He said, and tell me about 
Ehsan. Ehsan meaning like uh, maybe piety or, or goodness they translate it often. But the Prophet ﷺ gives us the meaning of Ihsan in the hadith. He said, أَن تَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى فَإِن لَمْ تُكُونْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ The Prophet ﷺ said about Ihsan. He said it is to worship Allah alone. As if you were seeing Him. And although you cannot see Him, know that He sees you. That's Ihsan. Is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are alone. It is when you are praying to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to know that He's watching you and to try to focus yourself in your prayer as if you're standing right before your Lord even though you can't see Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now I want to mention some of the benefits we can derive from this hadith. And there's still much more in the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ spoke about the, when the day of judgment would come. The Prophet ﷺ spoke about some of the signs of the day of judgment. But we're not going to get into that here. I just want to bring about some of the fawaid, some of the benefits that we can derive from this hadith. And one of the benefits that the scholars mention that we can get from this hadith azim is it shows us the importance of seeking knowledge about those affairs you need to know about the religion. Talib al-ilm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسَلَ أَهْلِ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, ask the people of knowledge if you don't, if you don't know. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So when you don't know an issue, you don't know the answer, then go to someone who has knowledge about that issue. Don't try to make your own ijtihad. Well, I think it means this. I was reading in a tafsir, I think it means this. I think I'll practice like this. No. If it's something you don't know that it's not clear to you, go to the people of knowledge. Go to the students of knowledge. Go to the imams of the masajid, those that have some knowledge that can give you some benefit and clarity in the issue to protect yourself from the sharr. Because it is from sharr, it's from evil if you begin to make fatwa yourself without knowledge. وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ May Allah protect us all from that. Another benefit that we gain from this hadith is this hadith shows us that a person can be ignorant even if they memorize the Qur'an. Even if they memorize Kitab Allah. That's a foundation. That gives you the nusus, it gives you the text. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you know the religion. How many Muslims from all over the world don't know Arabic language and they've memorized the Qur'an? Many, many. So then how can you practice it if you don't know it? So again it tells, it shows us another benefit along with that benefit is that just because a person has memorized something doesn't mean they have knowledge. And what is going to be beneficial for the person, especially those who are teaching their children or having their children learn the Qur'an, send your children when they're old enough to sit with the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah. That's it. If you want your child to really have knowledge, or if you yourself want to gain knowledge, you can't sit with just anyone. And we learn this from the hadith. This is one of the benefits that the ulama have mentioned. Another benefit we gain from this hadith is that seeking knowledge from other than Ahlul Sunnah can sometimes cause more harm than benefit. Why do I say this? Because if you memorize many hadiths with someone who says you can go make dua to the grave, what benefit is that going to benefit you? You've memorized many hadiths, but then in your aqidah, your belief, you believe you can pray to the graves. But instead, if you had learned one or two hadiths, would be better than a thousand hadiths from someone who has shirk bid'ah mukaffara. They have innovation that takes them out of the religion. It would be better to learn two hadiths correctly from someone from Ahl Sunnah than someone who has that kind of innovation. So again, be careful who you take your knowledge from. Another benefit we gain from this hadith is this hadith teaches us 
to return to the usul, to the foundation of the religion, to go back to check our Islam, to check our iman, to check our uh, our ihsan. Those are the maratib al-deen. Those are the levels of the deen. And they're the, the levels of Islam. So we have to check ourselves and, 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 and try to make sure that we're practicing correctly. Another important benefit that we have to remember also is that if a person says they're a Muslim and they do not believe in all the pillars of Islam or all the pillars of Iman, that negates their Islam. You can't say, yes, I'm a Muslim, but I don't believe in Prophet Moses. No, you're not a Muslim then. You can't say you're a Muslim and you don't believe in Jesus. No, you have to believe in Jesus. That is a part of our religion. And you should love them because they were the best of mankind and they got the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit, it shows us the importance of actually striving to better ourselves through knowledge. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith, he said, "Men salaka tariqin yal talmisuhu bihi elmin sahala lahu lahu tariqin ilal jannah." He said that whenever a person traverses the path to gain knowledge, then Allah will make easy the path to jannah. Subhanallah. That's enough to all encourage us all that at least tonight to read one hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because that's a part of seeking the knowledge. Spend time with your family. Read a hadith. Read an Islamic book. Share one benefit. This is a part of that knowledge. And what's better than that is if you can go sit with a talib al-ilm. And what's better than that if you can go sit with a scholar. But now with the internet you can get many of those benefits. Walhamdulillah. So I advise myself and my brothers and sisters to benefit yourself in the religion. And a, a, a benefit along with that hadith is the Salaf, the righteous predecessors, meaning the Sahaba and the ta- the, those who followed them and their students, that they used to say, Talib al-Ilm, Talib al-Jannah. That to seek the knowledge is to seek paradise. That's how they looked at Talib al-Ilm. They didn't look at seeking knowledge in order to make their status big. They didn't, order, they didn't seek the knowledge to say, yeah, I'm a sheikh, yeah, I'm a student of knowledge, yeah, I'm a person who memorized the Qur'an. No, they sought knowledge because they really believed that, hey, that's the path to paradise. I want to get there. Talib al-Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with tawfiq. And there's many other benefits I wanted to mention, but our time may be coming short. I want to mention one last benefit from this hadith. And there are so many, there's whole books written just about this hadith. About this hadith, you'll find, I think Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, I think he has two big volumes, books like this big, two of them in Arabic, just about this hadith. And it shows you the, the many, many benefits. But this last benefit I wanted to mention, is it also shows us the importance of having good manners. Because when Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, when he sat with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he did it with good manners. He sat down next to the Prophet. And he put his knees next uh, to the Prophet's knees. And he put his hands on his knees. That's a way of being humble. And then he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he asked him, tell me about Islam. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So that shows us that we have to work on our manners. And some of the scholars of the past, they used to work on their manners and believe to work on your manners before you seek the knowledge even. Because the one with good manners, his heart's going to be more open to the knowledge. But the one who has bad manners, he may memorize a lot, he or she may memorize a lot, but their practice is going to be weak. The Prophet ﷺ said in this regard, قال, ما من شيء أثقل في ميزان المؤمن يوم القيامة من حسن الخلق وإن الله يبغض الفاحشة بذي. The Prophet ﷺ said, There won't be a thing on the scale of the believers on the day of judgment heavier than good manners. And verily Allah dislikes foul speech. So watching our tongue. We have to watch and guard our tongue. And we have to try to have good manners with one another. Good manners with everyone we encounter. They should see, wow, that's a Muslim? Okay, I, I kind of want to learn more about Islam. Even if they don't want to be a Muslim, at least if they see your good manners, 
then they'll be more interested in Islam. They'll say, hey, I thought Muslims were just like the people we saw on TV, the ones who put the bombs on their back, the one who tried to blow up this, the one who tried to do this. No, that's not Islam. That's not the representatives of Islam. But instead, we are emissaries of Islam. So show that in your manners. سُئِلَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنْ سُئِلَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنْ أَكْثِرِ مَا يُرْخَلَ النَّاسَ الْجَنَّةِ قَالَ تَقُوَ اللَّهِ وَحُسْنُ الْخُلْقِ وَسُئِلَ أَنْ أَكْثِرِ مَا يُرْخَلَ النَّاسَ النَّارِ قَالَ أَفْهِمْ وَفَرَجِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه was asked, "What is the thing that will get us into paradise the most?" And he صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Having good manners and and fearing Allah." And then he was asked, and what is the thing that will enter us in the hellfire the most? He said, the tongue and the private parts. Meaning, that the person who is reckless in their speech, reckless, they'll say anything. That they are just making their rewards go down more. They're losing. Those sins are taken away from their good deeds. Because they'll say anything. And that's the opposite of having good manners. Good manners is a person who's maybe quiet, but yet you see, you can see it in their conduct. And you never hear them cursing and, 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 and speaking foul to other people. And the second thing the Prophet ﷺ said, mentioned in that hadith, he said, Al-Faraj. He said the private parts, meaning the person who commits adultery and fornication. This is also will get rid of your good deeds. And this is one of the major sins. So protect yourself from all kind of sins. And I ask Allah the Almighty to bless us all with tawfiq, and bless us with ikhlas and thabat ala sunnah, and bless us all with al nafi wa riskin tayyib wa amalin mutaqabilin. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Muslimin in every place. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify our conditions and bless us all to be students of, the, of, of, the, of Jannah, of paradise. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our affairs easy and bless us to go to paradise and be of Ahl Jannah. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله وحده الله شكرا Thank <clears throat> you.